let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. If you've been watching here at all and you've seen how many hugs these three folks have gotten from team members over the last uh, 10 minutes, you probably have a bit of a sense of uh, how we feel about our partner from, uh, from Utah State. I am uh, thrilled to be able to kind of introduce these three, this institution, this partner, um, specifically because I know so many of us don't have the same opportunity to spend a lot of time in the field with our partners to get that kind of fingertip feel of what's really happening on the ground at institutions that are adopting, uh, enabling, and, and using the tools that, uh, that we spend all day, every day building. Uh, so uh, we have here today, uh, John Louvier, who's the executive director there, uh, heads up the really many of the innovation initiatives across the institution, and I think has some, uh, some extremely compelling insights on the importance of curation when it comes to innovation and investment in partnerships, uh, you cannot invest in innovating on every single front simultaneously. Uh, Civitas and this team has been very fortunate to be uh, one of the lucky few, I think, that the institution is really kind of centered on from an innovation perspective. Um, Mitchell was actually hired very specifically to, to drive and lead the Civitas work um, within Utah State, which is a, a best practice that uh, I think probably many of our partners could learn from, the, the value and in innovation, and Mitchell comes from a background of pretty deep research on higher ed and retention. His ability, I think, to advocate uh, for, for these efforts and initiatives from a student perspective and from an institutional perspective has been pretty transformative. Um, and Amanda is our newest uh, member of the Utah State team, uh, the first data wrangler, and is doing uh, really some kind of client-focused support of institutional initiative evaluation using the impact tool. Uh, so sort of becoming the face of impact uh, inside of Utah State, helping with that evaluation. So without uh, any further ado, I'd love to introduce uh, some of our very, very favorite partners, and I don't just say that because they're standing behind me. Uh, Utah State, thanks for being here. Thank you. And uh, because you are all in front of us, you are our absolute favorite vendor. Just want you all to know that. Okay, so um, uh, I, what we're going to share with you today is a little bit about Utah State, who we are, just so you understand that and where we come from. And, um, and everything that I'll be, uh, I will be sharing and Mitchell and Amanda will be sharing is really all Mitchell, Amanda, and you. I really have nothing to do with this. I'm just the guy. That's, that's my role in all of this. So... So I want to I want to give attribution where it belongs. So now for story time, okay? Um, as as you all know, a hammer does not build the house. So I want you to picture me now, back in the 1990s, late 80s, 90s. I was about 118 pounds. I was aspiring to be an Olympic athlete, a runner, and uh, and I had absolutely zero upper body strength, none. But to make, my, make money in the summer, I framed houses. So I was a pickup framer. And I was really good with a, uh, a weighted hammer, framing hammer, you know, with little teeth on the end. I could, I could um, set it and sink, or set and sink. I could just, bam, put them in. I was great with my hammer. I also, in my tool belt, had a, um, a nail remover, you know, claw, the, the pull out. Now, interestingly enough, I would spend about as much time removing nails as I would setting and hammering nails. Though I would put in hundreds of nails very quickly and efficiently with my hammer, but when I screwed up, which I did fairly often, I'd have to pull that out and I'd spend more time pulling the nails out. So those were, those were my tools, and that's how I built my houses. Well, my boss came along, and uh, this was, <laughs> if, if any of you were framers back in the early 90s, you'll remember these big, heavy uh, pneumatic nailers. So the first thing he showed was like, Hey, John, go, go pull out a, um, a compressor out of the back of the truck. Now, this compressor weighed as much as me. It was huge. So wrestled the thing out of the truck, and he was like, okay, with the nailer, hey, you're going to be more efficient now. we got these really cool nailers. Now, these nailers were nailers. Like, there was, there was very little ergonomics in that nailer. It weighed as much as me. Half. I mean, it was, the thing was heavy. I could barely heft it up. But I got to the point where I could nail... In above my head, I could go in corners, I could actually nail quite quickly. It was a very efficient tool when it was used properly. Of course, I didn't get any training, I was just, you know, just used it. Okay, so as you can see the analogy, okay, this tool that you guys are providing is very efficient, okay, and it requires professionals. 
Now, I'm going to finish this story. And as you can see, this, this nailer is pointed to something very much applicable that's part of my appendage. It's right here on my finger. One time I was at the end of the day and I had just, I'd been knocking in nails and I was bent over. I, was, I had, I had a, a wall held up and I had just nailed in um, a couple studs to the top plate and I hit a knot. Now when, when this nailer would go off, it would, the, the recoil would shoot it out like that because I couldn't hold it. It would just pop back. So it hit a knot, popped out, and then quickly nailed my finger to the top plate. So <laughs> therein lies the power and the capacity <laughs> of an untrained trained person using this great tool. And so there I was nailed to the wall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so our role and what we're trying to accomplish is to train the right people with the right tools. The tool is absolutely a necessity to be efficient. But what's more important than that is our role and our ability to be able to to be able to empower our employees to be able to use these, to train them to be professionals and to be professionals with this tool and to hopefully not harm themselves or others with these because there's a lot of capacity to do that. Now that, oops, did I just skip a bunch? Oh, there we go. So now <clears throat> um, to that point, the tool is necessary. It's absolutely necessary. I could not frame a house without the hammer, but the, ha the house is not going to be built without the person, the trained person that's using the hammer. So it is, it is absolutely necessary, but not sufficient. Um, so what we're trying to accomplish and what we're trying to, to uh, what we have tried to do in our implementation process is to, to foster a, and empower our employees at the university to be both necessary and meaningful, those human action interactions are absolutely necessary and also sufficient utilizing the tools. So that's been the challenge that we've had over these past two years. And, uh, and I think we've been fairly successful. That's for you to yet judge. So what I'd like to do then is hand it off to my colleagues to then talk about what it is that we did in the process and some of the outcomes as a result of it. Thanks, John. John's always a hard act to follow. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be down here with you guys. We're really excited, we're having a good time. As John talks about this, uh, we, wanna, we wanna talk about the importance of training professionals, right? How do you get someone to trade the, the hammer that they love for this new uh, weapon, right? That, that can be powerful and actually really effective and efficient if you know how to use it, right? Uh, a lot of the times we, we're hearing complaints, oh, um, you just want me to adopt a new tool because it's you know, innovation for innovation's sake, right? And what we try to help them understand is, is that that their professionalism is actually the silver bullet. It's the tool, right? That their professionalism is, is the, the necessary. But unfortunately, in the 21st century, their professionalism isn't sufficient. Things have changed too much and we're losing too many students, right? And so that to, to get them to understand that in the 21st century, that this deeper professionalism with the right tools and resources is both necessary and sufficient is, is the key. So how do you get them to trade their tool? So here's a, a few examples that we, we have. So in May, we did what's called the Summer Analytics Academy. Now, we had 60 different colleagues attend this, um, all the way up from vice presidents and deans, all the way down to program coordinators and advisors. And um, the, the draw was you're gonna learn about analytics. It was six two-hour sessions, so 12 hours of content, professional development, essentially. And you'd think that we'd spend a lot of time talking about tools, right? But instead, the amount of time that maybe Civitas tools were on the screen in the 12 hours uh, academy was maybe 30 minutes. And you think, how does that happen? Well, we had to basically prepare them each session. We would have to say, you've come to hear more about analytics and surely we'll talk about those tools. But those tools are, are not sufficient. They're necessary, but they're not gonna be enough. Your professionalism, in combination with those tools is what we're after. And so we're gonna spend a lot of time in each session talking about things like leadership. So a lot of the sessions were about leadership training, leadership models of leadership, and how do analytics fit into those models of leadership? Uh, the first three sessions were about logic model and program evaluation. Amanda did a great job 
presenting on some content uh, relative to program evaluation. All three of us have had doctoral training in program evaluation and education. And so those three sessions were six hours of basically, how do you even do program evaluation? Because if you don't understand the whole cycle of evaluation, you're not gonna understand this very key component, which is analytics, right? Amanda's gonna talk more about that. We also did a session about uh, optimizing advisor um, output and productivity. Most of that was an ethics training. Very little to do with Inspire for Advisors, although we did talk about it, we showed it off. Most of it had to do with the ethics of not reaching out to students who could be saved and who could be basically developed uh, if we were only to do that work. We did a session for improving teaching. Yes, courses, Illum courses was involved in that session, but most of it had to do with grading philosophy, with syllabus design, right? Analytics supports that, courses supports that activity, but faculty members actually care about developing syllabus, better syllabus, better grading philosophy. They don't necessarily care about adopting analytics for its own sake. So we wrap the two together and then they love it. They think it's the best thing ever. They leave and they say, this is the best professional development I've ever been to, and I've been here at this university for 20 years. That was a real comment. And it was because we were looping in new skills, this new technologies with traditional stuff like syllabus design that, that really the tools help to enhance that, right? And then we also did empowering the liberal arts or the liberal arts experience through analytics, which was really well received. And some feedback on that was that it was a long overdue conversation. So we, you can see that, that yes, the tools are involved, but the focus is on professionalism, deeper professionalism in the 21st century. So as part of that, we have these kind of three core philosophies or elements of professional empowerment. Professional agency, which is that the agent gets to tell you what the narrative is, like the professional knows their story. They know what's important to them and you honor that, their agency. Um, you offer development, sure, and you expect competence. You have high expectations through offering the development that they actually will improve and that they will change their activities, right? Because yesterday's solutions don't produce tomorrow's results. And also you have this kind of accountability. Now that's a scary word. Um, accountability, a lot of people think of that as like putting someone under your thumb and getting them to report to you and stuff like this. For us, it's all about relationships and conversations, right? So that accountability means talking to you and talking, having you talk back to me and having a, a shared feedback about what could be better for you as a professional and what could be better at, as an institution at the institutional level. And so these three kind of uh, philosophy um, principles uh, guide all the work that we do. We keep coming back to these principles as essential to the change management that we want and the adoption of analytics that we want. Now, here's an example of that. With our academic advisors, we did the typical software training. I have been training in eight, uh, higher ed for about eight years now. And I did a typical, I'd never trained software before. So I did a typical click here, click here. This is this feature, this is this feature in Inspire for Advisors. And that's great. We also talk about taking it to action. Okay, now after you click through all this stuff, how do you take it to action? And you can see kind of adoption was not incredible. So number of users never went above 59, even though more than 100 people were trained. Um, the core of that is 70 advisors. And then logins were kind of like, uh, just okay, right? It wasn't what we wanted to see. So I went around and you, we do what's called data therapy. <laughs> so this, this woman saying, I really like the user interface, but I still have questions about data freshness. And that's really some of the things advisors would, would tell us. You know, why is it every two days? Why can't it be quicker and all this stuff? And so we'd have to set their expectations and manage their expectations, but also listen. We did a lot of listening. We had big ears and we went around and, and I was trained as a counselor. So I had all the right questions in my toolbox. You know, how did that make you feel? <laughs> what are we avoiding? Before I leave, what are we avoiding? And so anyway, so they would tell me these things. I went and asked, uh, about 15 different advisors who were power users, the people who had logged in the most. And I knew that I needed to ask them because a lot of times people would be in a big group meeting, advisor would criticize Civitas or the product. And then I'd go and look and they had logged in one time after training. And so then you're like, well, that's not a mature criticism, right? So I went to the 15 power users and they told us what they thought. And basically the, what they said is, is that actually, although you trained us to click here, click here, click here, there's seven or eight things that are super valuable in there. They're the golden nuggets of Inspire for Advisors. And we want to do those. We love to do those. They're things we already know how to do. 
And, and to your credit, these are things that, I don't know, is Carl Thorne Thompson? Where is he? Yeah, there he is. Hey, Carl. So for, for this situation, what, what essentially what they were saying, is, I don't like the feel of the ha handle of the, of the new hammer. I like my old handle better on the hammer. Can't you make it a little bit more like my old hammer? And so we would give product enhancement feedback and, and you guys follow it. That's the best thing is, is we say, oh, this and this, and then we get all these new features and it's amazing. And then I get to send emails to advisors saying, hey, remember that thing you asked for? Well, I called Civitas and they said yes because you wanted it. Now, I know that you do it for more than just our one advisor, <laughs> but they don't have to know that. So there's these, what we found is, is that they weren't logging in every day or even every week. What they were doing was logging in in logical times in their workflow where the activities suggested or the powerful activities that inspire empowers made sense. So we, we developed on a new training, this timeline, this best practices timeline. And the cool thing is what they love, there's a, a section that you can see multiple places that says too busy for analytics. Advisors think that's the best thing that we're giving them like, like validation that they know that there's times in the semester they don't want to use analytics. Guess what? It's weeks one through three. They don't care. They don't care. So we say, well, done, don't, don't, don't. The predictions don't stabilize for three weeks anyway because of LMS activity. And so start in week four with the predictions. And they thought that was great. So all of this feedback we get, we put in this timeline and then we build out a new training, which we, we focused on two halves. The first half is all about professionalism, right? So that top half, we talk about ethics. This was a big thing that came up. They wanted, uh, to talk about privacy and things. So we, we went there, we, we talked about ethics. We also use these professionalism examples. So one is nursing. We reminded them that they have really great education as advisors. They were hired to be people people. And that's what we wanted them to continue to do. That their hard work with students was the most important thing they could be doing, not logging into software. And that, and that in the nursing world, we have really good examples of how healthcare analytics are helping and empowering nurses to do really great work. The trick there, though, is, is that the nurses' training and professionalism, and their years of experience, are valued more highly than the analytic insights. So a nurse has the power to turn off the analytic insight when she thinks it's wrong. She just has to say why. And they're saving lives because they're, they're looking at the professional as core and the tool as ancillary. And the tool is what's saving lives, but it's in combination with the professional, right? So neither one is sufficient. Both the professional and the tool are necessary. Both together are sufficient, but separated, they're not sufficient. And so the advisors love that partly because there's this professionalism. They don't want to be seen as workers, right? They want to see, and so a nursing example, they're like, yeah, I am like a nurse. That's great. We also use a lifeguarding example to remind them that people are actually dying academically and that they have the power to save them if they dive in. But we remind them that how you choose to dive in, there's some ethics to that also, right? You don't just call a student and say, I have an analytic system and it tells me that you're red and, <laughs> and I need to reach out to you. So I am, right? We don't do that. So there's ethics around how you manage your, your outreach, right? So that's the whole first half of the training is all professionalism and ethics. And then the second half of the training is now best practices timeline. And it's very seven or eight click here, click here. That's all that we want you to do. It is very makes sense, very pragmatic things. And then they love it. Because when we were showing them the whole product, they were like, oh, they were, they, we, we call it data drunk. And they're like, oh, it's too much. And so um, basically, this training really worked. So here's what happened. So we released this new training and new resource, the best practices timeline in February. And this is what happened in logins. So they're more than double. <laughs> now, you'll see that tapering off towards the end. And you might be like, oh, it didn't stick. No, that's the training. We told them that near the end of the semester, the product doesn't work as well as at the beginning and middle. And so they should use it less. And they're like, oh, that makes sense. Because if you're going to save a student, you don't wait till finals week, right? So that's partly what we see there. We, we're hopeful that in fall, we'll see a similar pattern and it'll be just as high. Now, an important thing is, is that advisors were invited to basically have one-on-one -on -one contact with students. They feel like the tools are getting in the way of that. And so we just say, no, 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 that's the most important thing. This is a slide deck that we show them to humanize analytics. Uh, basically, uh, we say that inviting one-on-one -on -one contacts is the most important thing you can do. We don't care how you do it. Now, that may seem scary because we're saying don't use Inspire for advisors. But what we know is if they try to do it with Outlook Mail Merge, they're going to be very unhappy. Some of them really like to use a CRM because it sends a text. And that texting feature is like gold to them. So they use that. We don't tell them not to do that. 
because they're the professional agent and their decisions are what matter. So we support them and say, that's great. But what we trust, what we trust and have faith in is the advisors that are willing to try this something new and who get used to it, that they become like really good commercials for Inspire for Advisors, right? Because they're so happy with how easy it is to use. So we don't worry and force adoption and go around like Gestapo and say, you will use Inspire for Advisors. Instead, we show them the advantages and then when we know people are using it and getting good results, we put them on panels in front of everyone and say, look at these glowing faces and smiles. We had one advisor say that during the busiest week of the year, she got to go home at five for the first time ever because of Civitas. And everyone was like, wow, really? What am I doing wrong? <laughs> the answer is Outlook Mail Merge, right? So, okay. So we encourage them to invite one-on-one -on -one contact, but we don't govern how they do it. And here's what we show them. So in fall 2017, did the student receive a nudge inviting one-on-one -on -one contact? 6,400 uh, basically students, they said yes. And that was through multiple systems, not just Inspire. But 9,200, no. The advisors just said, well, my door's open. They know I'm here and nice. So isn't that enough? But you can see the difference in projected persistence, which we'll actually verify come out October, but you guys have good models, so we trust the good rock curves, right? So we know that this prediction is pretty accurate. And so 87 versus 83, that's not that big of a difference, it's just three and a half percent, but you divide it one way and the other, you get 84 students projected to be retained that otherwise wouldn't have been, and 184 students lost. You put that in dollars, it's a million dollar difference, and it's really intense. We had an advisor see this, and then she went home, and unfortunately she cried, and then came back to work and said, you know, I've been doing it wrong because I've just had an open door policy. And I thought that that was sufficient. I didn't realize that there were students that needed me to call them and to email them and invite them in. So it's this really powerful change because we're supporting them in their agency and their development. Uh, we did this with faculty where we use courses to actually help them build a better syllabus. So courses is, I don't know if it was tooled to do that, but it's how we're using it. They love it. Um, so we train them in the middle. It's a two hour thing. Courses on, on the screen maybe for 15 minutes. That's enough. And then the rest is all about creating philosophy and syllabus design and they love it. And they come away really happy. And it also we focus on something called documentation of teaching improvement activity, which is for promotion and tenure. They have to do that. And we show them how analytics can support something they already want to do. This is called the premac principle. If I buy new vitamins and I want to take them every day, but I don't look in the kitchen cabinet that often, then I don't take my vitamins every day. One thing I love to do in the morning is wash my face. If I put my vitamins next to the sink, then every time I wash my face, which is I'm already likely to do, I'll also take my vitamins. And that's what basically we're doing in this. In empowering professional, professionalism, we're saying the things you're already doing are good, and we just want to tack something on that you're less likely to do, but that's also important. And that pre-MAC principle kicks in and is really very effective. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I took a drink at the wrong time. <laughs> Goodness. Um, another thing that we do to empower our professionals is we use impact analyses. Um, this is one of the slides that we've used um, at very executive levels and across the state of a few of the impact analyses that we've run. Um, but if anyone in here works on the impact analyses, they know that I've run many, many, many more than six. Um, <laughs> I'm like my four-year-old who just asks question after question, why this and why that and why this and why that? But um, I have found such good information in the impact analyses and the data that already exists in our organizations. Um, and so using the impact analyses, we're able to return information to them that they didn't even know that they could have. So they weren't gonna ask the questions because they never knew that it was possible to do. Um, and if you take a look, a closer look at this slide, you can see some of these percentages. Some are a little bit larger, some are a little smaller, but there's also other numbers that are on there and it's the tuition dollars retained and the number of students that, are, um, that stay persist to the next semester that we're expected not to. Um, and when we take this information back, some of our organizations are like, blah, don't tell me about tuition. This isn't about tuition, this is about my students. When you bring it back and you show them that they're actually affecting students, um, families, communities, like it becomes a very motivating and that analytic for them personally um, that they like to share. 
Um, and recently we were in a conversation. Um, they were wondering if impact could be used to be an ax. You know, we're seeing you don't have an impact over here. Um, can we use this to cut? They also were concerned that we were only showing them positive results. Like, okay, you're showing me these pretty six um, analyses that you've done. What about the other ones? And we talked for a moment about the purpose of analytics um, at our institution. And as you've heard a few times, the purpose is to develop leaders, to build professionalism in our organization. And so we said, no, impact isn't for cutting, but impact is for building. So what we say that when we get the results back, it empowers their decision-making. It allows them to adapt and refine their program so that they are able to approach impacts that are important for their organization um, and also to track change. So we've, we try and frame this even from very high up levels where they may have an eye on the bottom line. You know, we frame it and we say, you know, this is a tool for building. This is a tool for making us better. Um, and so we're very glad to have the impact tool and we're very, um, very pleased with how individuals are adapting to it. Uh, one thing that we do, and I presented at Summit and I showed um, reports that we make. We make um, pretty reports. They're getting prettier. We have a very good, uh, very talented team working on beautifying what's coming out. Um, but I had a few individuals from Summit contact me and say, hey, like, I want your report. And I was so hesitant to say, it's not reports. Reports are necessary, but they're not sufficient. They're not sufficient for the cultural change. Um, instead, what we do since we're a service organization is we provide an experience for individuals around impact analyses. Um, and the first one is this initial consult and then really, you know, we're crossing our fingers. We've had very few people turn down a data handoff, um, but we're making them part of our data therapy is making them comfortable with the idea that they're entering data therapy. Um, but the first thing that we do is we help them understand their relationship to persistence because people um, oftentimes they want to serve people they, they don't really they don't want to turn their people into a shallow number they don't want to look at the tuition but we help them understand that for any one of the things that they're actually trying to solve persistence is a good indicator for that um, so these are logic models. They come from the Kellogg's Foundation. It's to help organize uh, a person's train of thought for why they do what they do. So it starts to look like this. You can come in and, and people usually have an easier time saying, oh, these are things that I have and these are things that I do. And a lot of times the ball stops there. They, they don't really understand their next step. They know that it's good, feels good to do this. So we're going to keep on doing it. Um, and this middle section we're going to skip over because this is the part that scares people. That outputs is what you're supposed to be able to measure. And so we say, all right, so you know the things you have, you know the things you do. Let's talk about what you want to be doing. And it's, you know, make the world a better place with rainbows and kittens for everyone. Um, and so it's just kind of this broad idea of what they think they're adding to. And we say, okay, let's, let's break that down. What do you think we do? Or what do you think your program does? Students are doing better things, something along that line. And we talk to them and help them associate that with the output, which is measurable, which is wink, wink, persistence. We don't downgrade other things that they want to measure. We help them find an uh, avenues to look at other, other things that are important to them. But we say persistence is vital to helping students move towards graduation. So let's, let's take a look at this. And when people were asking just for the report, or if you're looking at just what comes up on the screen after you've submitted something to impact, what you'd be doing is you would be saying, here is persistence and here is what should be important to you but they haven't taken those steps to understand that yes, it actually is important to me. They don't, they don't understand why they should care about persistence. So just having a report gives them this and it's insufficient for a cultural change. And if we stop for a second, my purse, I have a personal logic model for my job. And um, one of my outcomes is that 
uh, directors start to use these impact analyses. But one of the outputs that I personally measure is them starting to ask their own questions. So because I run a bazillion impact analyses, what my brain is doing is saying, oh, you know what, we could look at um, just at undergraduates. We have different regional campuses. We'll look at those. Um, we did an orientation one, and sometimes we have older students and younger students, and does orientation affect older students different than it does younger students and so it lets them kind of direct this but i bring back these reports and i'm like i asked this question and this question and this question and they inevitably have other questions and it becomes um engaging to them so that we can find out what they're really interested in help them find solutions to the problems that they're seeing um, but i do think that's an important thing is bringing them interesting solutions or interesting um, not solutions, but interesting uh, findings from the analytics. And then they find their own things that they want to know. So, um, And that gets us to this delivery. So we have our beautiful summary that we take, them, uh, take to them. But as an analyst, it's dangerous to also be the interpreter. So they have so much more information and context about what's going on in their problem or their program that I don't have. Although it's I do. But the important thing is, is that you let them walk to their own solutions. So you bring them results. Say, you know, these are things that I've found that are interesting. What do you see? And it builds their ability to integrate the findings into what they're doing. There's also an important step that we do, which is kind of a mid, um, a, a mid check to see if they're actually making the changes what they've decided to do this is important for accreditation it helps them um, but it also helps us integrate the tool because they, they want to see change um, and then we have lots of follow-ups we plan for the future and we get them involved on this cyclical evaluation process most of the entities that we have provided an impact analysis for have decided to um, continue on the evaluation cycle every year. Some have asked us to rerun things when the new semester, when we get new census, or when we hit the census date. But um, they're all engaged and they want to keep doing this. It's not a one and done. This is something that we're continuing to use that's really being integrated into programs across our university and then answering interesting, complex, and fun problems. Um, and I think John gets to. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Isn't the work they're doing fantastic? They've... Okay, to, to Amanda's point, the last thing that we want to see is to have the her reports nailed to the wall. Ha ha. That's fun. Okay. So. Um, if it would come as no surprise to you after this presentation that we actually did a logic model for our visit here. So what is it that we wanted to accomplish in coming down here and this message that we shared with you? We, so we sat down and we went through it and um, I didn't share this with the, with, with the guys on my logic model, but one of the, the outputs that, that I initially thought is like, oh, we'll come down and we'll make system engineers and the data scientists and the salespeople cry. We're gonna give them testimonials that they're just gonna love. But then we thought, no, we'll give them something a little more practical. So that's what you saw today. Okay. It's a bit more practical. However, uh, we did um, have a couple other things that we wanted to do. So um, what I call our latent aims or the, the far reaching outcomes is we wanted to reduce our licensing for the next round. So Sierra, where, no. <laughs> Far out there. Now, the, the, the primary output of this meeting and why we're presenting and putting energy into this for you is we want you to all know that we are a safe institution to work with you. We're here to be your solution. We're really here to support you to be successful. The more, and we truly believe this, the more successful you are, the more successful we can be. We really need the right tools. We'll, it is our responsibility to develop the right people to use your tools, but we need these to be very effective. And so, so we, we believe that. So if you have ideas or concepts 
and, and, and they can be conceptual. They can just be out there. Feel free to contact us and say, hey, hey we're, this is just on a scratch paper. We're thinking about this. What's your reaction? We'll tell you what we think. And if you say, don't share it because it may never happen, that's fine. We're okay with that. We're safe. We're willing to do that with you. And we're willing to provide, try to provide you the perspective that would not be only from our institution, but from those that we're working with. Um, another one of the uh, objectives that we have, and I have with our team here, is that we want to be the national or international leaders in applications of learning analytics. And, and as much with the research side as the application side of it. And that's what I want to develop. And that's what I want Utah State to be known for. Yeah, we can shoot off great rockets, that's cool. And we can provide services and accessibility to education to our state, that's fantastic. But I also want to be a leader in this space. And so that's one of the objectives that we have. And that's why we're here. So um, we want to leave with you a couple things. And uh, we want to leave with you some, some uh, maybe strategies that you can use uh, for all of you. And, and so the one is, um, here's a, a paper that was written by a, a good friend of mine, Kimberly Arndel, out of University of Wisconsin and some other colleagues. Back in 2014, it was published at the LAC conference. And this paper is what we, it's like three pages maybe, and we call it the Bible. It is when anybody contacts us and says, hey, we want to implement learning analytics. We're like, great, read this paper and read it line by line because this will outline every, the product and everything that you saw today came in that, is, is from that paper. It was how to build capacity, how to build the human infrastructure necessary for your tools to work. So that's, that's one of the things. The other thing that we'd like to share with you, and this is for um, all those of you that are involved in the, uh, the pre-sales, so when you show up and, you're, and you're, you're responding to maybe to an RFP or an RFI, request for information around your product, um, what you need to do is you need to, to size up the, the people in the room. So this is the, the therapy situation that we, we deal with. So when, when Mitchell comes in and there's a group of advisors or a group of administrators, what we do is we walk in the room and we start looking around at what's in their tool belt. So what is it they have? Now, um, sometimes it's very apparent and we know their tool belts. There's one guy, we have one administrator that comes to every meeting with a pile of spreadsheets. He is the spreadsheet man. And I'm sure every institution has it. You probably have gone to visit those and he'll pull out his spreadsheets and I can do it in, my, I can do it in Excel. We don't need this. Okay, so that's the one guy. So, there's a, so we can see his tools. Now some of the other tools are not so apparent. So that may be the administrator or somebody sitting in the back, the advisor that's been there for 20 years, they got their legs crossed and they're not willing to listen to anything you have to say, but they're there for whatever reason. Maybe they're forced to be there. Or they're compelled for some reason, but they're not open. Whereas you may have in the front row, you know, a, a, a new advisor that's like anxious and excited or a new administrator that's really willing to adopt something and they've got their notebook out and they're ready to go. That's their tool. So those are the things that you need to read. So we're going to share with you a way to categorize these people and to identify them as you go in and then empower them. So the first one that we want to begin with is, is come with a stack of t-shirts, all sizes, and identify your visionary. So when you show up, who in the institution has the vision? Who's going to take the chicken farmers and turn them into amazing student retention officers? Who is that? What, how can they see it? How, what is it they're going to do? How can you empower them with the knowledge and the abilities that they need? So identify your visionary. The next one is there's a nudgler. That's the advisor sitting in the front row that's excited. They're out there, they're gonna nudge, all, nudgel as I call it, all of their students. They're your nudgler. Then you've gotta have a data wrangler. And, and you need to identify that. And universities don't realize that they need a data wrangler, somebody that can clean it, organize it, uh, make sense of it, uh, read it. They've got to just pull it in. It's, it's actually, we stole that from the Open University. And Amanda's the first American data wrangler, Western data wrangler, if you will. And then uh, she played that role also as the impactor. Who's going to run those impact analyses? Which, by the way, 
Whoever came up with impact, the, the, the tool itself, maybe it's all of you collectively, that's the game changer in higher education. That is the tool that we'll see that will change the way that we see and act and behave with students from here on in the future. So well done, good job. So Impactor, ha, this is my favorite one. And, uh, and I wanted to, um, uh, what's that movie with the, 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 where he, the, the, the guy that blows his head off, it's the mind, the cartoon, I can't remember. Yeah, his face turns red. I can't remember the cartoon. My kids watched it. They go on the brain and he gets all excited. Anyway, so this is the rocket scientist. When you go in an institution and who works here on data mapping? Who's the implementation folks? I am here. Okay, you're going to know exactly who I'm talking about. You go in and they'll be like, oh, your mapping's all wrong. You guys don't know what you're doing. I could build this. Just give me like three, four FTEs and I can do this. I'm so smart. I know data science. I got it. There's always one of them in the room. You need to appeal to those guys. They're actually, they're probably really smart and they know they're really smart. And, uh, and you, you need to, to leverage them and give them the rocket scientist t-shirt because they are, they're doing great things. And, uh, and they'll also really get excited about a lot of things. Okay. <clears throat> so, so whoever came up with a loom, it was brilliant. It's got all these great graphs. It's got mom scores. It's got all, it's, everything's in there. It's fantastic. And when you sit down with somebody for the first time, they're just like, oh, this is so cool. Wow. And they click and filter and filter and filter and click and filter. And the next thing they know, they are just wasted. They're completely <laughs> off the rocker. They, they're like drooling. They don't know what they're going to do. And so the next thing you need to do is you've got to have a designated data driver. So someone thinks that you're okay. That's, that's our therapist here in the room. All right, then the next one, you need to identify your evangelist. They're not necessarily the visionary. In fact, I wouldn't say they're necessarily the visionary. The visionary is sometimes sort of out there. And when I walk into a room at, at our, my university, the, um, and I would be, I guess, considered the visionary at our institution, or one of them. But when I walk in the room, I'm not necessarily the evangelist or an effective evangelist because everybody groans when I walk in. They're like, oh, John's going to implement something new. I have to change. <laughs> ah. So it needs to be somebody different. Somebody that's a little more softer and caring and has big ears and is willing to listen. That's our evangelist. And the last one, and I think this is the absolute most important one, is identifying who has the ability to provide therapy that is necessary to change and to implement and to do hard things and to let people know that it's, that, that it's them as a professional that's very important and that's what we're most concerned with. And we're most concerned with our students and what they do with the students. And that's really the skills that come from a therapist. And so uh, with that, we'd like to thank you very much for uh, making it possible for us to help share with you um, how universities work, or at least work in utilizing your tools, and, um, and how we can accomplish what we can with, with all of you. So thank you.